can go into the heart of a sea egg. At the time, we were four years old, and I had spent several years trying to build and establish the cultural underpinnings of the company. And uh, this was the presentation that I used as kind of a form of summary. Many of these principles I'm about ready to share with you, some you've already seen in the prior call, but uh, others I have been sharing for several years in the company. And I think they give a nice window into some of the feelings we have about the business we're in, and particularly the people and how we treat the people in the company and in, in the field. I shared on the last call uh, to Australia that I maintain the philosophy that um, every corporation is, is a body. In fact, the word corporation comes from the same derivative as the word corporeal in English. Uh, in Spanish, cuerpo, the same concept is it's a body. And um, the organization is made up of organs. And we feel strongly that companies are bodies, but they also have to have a soul, just like any person you meet may have a body, but also has a spirit or a soul to them. And what I'm about to share with you to, uh, this morning for you and this afternoon for me represents what I feel is the soul of a SIA, the, the principles that, that kind of give us a spirit. And they're very important to me, and hopefully they resonate with you. So this is the presentation I shared in that environment, and I'm going to walk through this uh, with you today. I'm hoping that the video on the right-hand side doesn't over uh, uh, encroach on the screen and that you're able to see what we've got here. So let's start with the notion of culture. These are the behaviors, beliefs, and characteristics of a particular group of people. I'm anxious to experience the culture uh, down under with the Aussies, uh, better understand the behaviors, characteristics of that beautiful country and the beautiful people there. Um, and these cultural traditions, behaviors, and beliefs actually ultimately get transmitted down from one generation to another. And the, the concept of a corporate culture is not terribly different from uh, uh, someone studying uh, anthropology and studying different social cultures. Well, corporations have a set of behaviors, beliefs, and characteristics that then get transmitted from one generation inside the business to another. And, and in the case of distribution uh, through network marketing, it's almost doubly so these transmissions of beliefs and characteristics become an important part that we ask you to do. And so we've tried from the very beginning, as I mentioned earlier, to, to really clarify, well, what are some of the key behaviors, beliefs, and characteristics of our culture that we hope that you'll help us to transmit from one generation to another? Uh, I might add parenthetically as I start here, uh, um, I don't think of us as uh, a terribly traditional uh, network marketing company in the sense that um, I don't have any pictures of mansions or yachts or uh, really uh, you know, beautiful lifestyles in the presentation trying to excite someone and get them to have a blood pressure change as to why they should join a SIA. I don't fundamentally believe in that. Uh, I believe that everything in life that's worth doing requires work. And far too often, the industry, I believe, is indictable for over-signaling that you can do little and gain a great deal. Um, and while I do believe this industry remunerates people in a way that's very hard to find, I do not believe that that remuneration occurs in the absence of hard work. And, and so one of the key cultural underpinnings for us is not to run around telling people that this is a quick way to change your lifestyle from your current socioeconomic position into one of mansions and yachts and club memberships. That said, there are plenty of people in our company that are making very, very good incomes. We just believe that while it might not be, uh, it's possible to overstate the economics, we oftentimes find that it is very possible to overemphasize it. Uh, we believe that it's not what you earn from your labors that ultimately matters most, but fundamentally what you become by your labors that should carry the day. Now, again, that's not in the absence of income, but that's a key, key principle, and I think you'll see that played out here as I walk through this presentation. So the, fir the, the four corners of this cultural set of, of uh, characteristics, beliefs, and behaviors are uh, really these four things. Uh, the first and the top left is the formula I shared on the last video, and I'll just go back into that for the benefit of those that uh, might not have heard this or those that are listening in after it's been recorded. It's a simple formula that we refer to as EPC, and one that I've been sharing for many years as a, as a formula for success, and not only at, at ASEA, but in my prior life in the financial industry, I shared this there. And our current CEO, Chuck Funky, who I've worked with for many years in the financial sector, 
he and I felt very strongly about this then and continue to feel so now. In the top right of your screen is a is a concept that uh, might be a little hidden by the video uh, thumbnails here, but it's a book that I'm very committed to, uh, kind of a philo philosophy of how to interact with people. The name of the book is called The Anatomy of Peace. It was written by a consortium of philosophers that, that call themselves the Arbinger Institute uh, and is a sequel, actually, to a book written prior to this called Leadership and Self-Deception. And I'm going to take you through just a few concepts outlined in that book as well. On the bottom right, uh, you'll see what we kind of call our in the embodiment of our ethos is be three or believe, belong, become. And then the bottom left is, a, is an African philosophy that I'm just going to share that we've shared in many different settings as also a kind of an underpinning of how we hope to build a culture here at, at the company. So I'm going to walk you through each one. I'm going to start with uh, this first top left corner, which is the, the, the formula that we refer to as E squared PC. So uh, again, I shared this a little bit with, uh, with the last video, but let me just remind you, um, I've learned that there's a relationship between these three distinct elements. One is someone's ego and economic drive. Another is their commitment to principles. And then the third dimension is their capacity, their potential or actual ability. And throughout my career, uh, I've worked with people and in built, largely built distribution networks, people that sell and distribute products. And um, over the years, I've seen plenty of people get recognized for great, great work that they've done um, and then disappear the year after or not be, uh, not be around any further with the companies I was with before. And it wasn't uncommon for me to be sitting at a banquet of recognition with uh, someone sitting right next to me that's been 20 or 30 years in the, in the financial industry or business we were in then, who has um, never really been recognized but always done it right. And I started to ask questions about what is the formula for people that have long-term enduring success as opposed to someone who might spike up, have a great year, and then drop off the face of the earth or disappear. And as an organization then, we started to look for what are the characteristics, these cultural beliefs or norms, that we see in the people that most truly reflect long-term enduring success. And uh, over some time, I basically reduced it down to these three dimensions, ego and economic, which we refer to as E squared, and then P in the center is principles, and on the far right is capacity. And to illustrate how these things kind of interact one with the other, I throw it into a, a graph and I measure on the y-axis from zero to nine um, how motivated someone is by or for and how committed someone is to these three different dimensions. And as an example, uh, if you take a look at someone, let's say someone is highly motivated, or in this case, someone's motivated at a five on a scale from one to nine or zero to nine. Uh, in the form of ego and economics. That is to say that they're motivated by money and motivated by self kind of actualization and how they're viewed by others on a scale from zero to nine out of five. And you might say, well, is that good or is that bad? And for me, I can't answer that question fundamentally until I know the score and commitment to the second dimension of this little formula, which is principles. I want to know and understand if someone has a high degree of motivation and a high degree of commitment to principles vis-a-vis -vis or relative to ego and economic drives. And what do I mean by that? Well, when I teach my children the concept of principles, I tell them always try to focus your decisions in life and your commitments around core principles. The definition that I've often used for principles is concentrated truth things that can be applied to a wide variety of circumstances and always, always work. Now that might be words like honesty or humility or civility or kindness, but each of those principles I've learned are enduring truths that when you live your life aligned with them, increases the probability of success. What I've learned is that in life there come times when you might actually be tempted to put yourself in a position where your motivations and commitments as measured on the y-axis might start to move in a different direction. So the early rule for us is to try to keep your ego and economic motivations and commitments beneath those of your commitments to principles. Now, 
that's the rule that we refer to as keep E under P, uh, by and large. Now, we all know situations that look and feel like this, where someone's motivation for and commitment to things in their life that have to do with money or things that have to do with gratifying their ego actually accelerate much higher than their commitment to principles. And this is something that can be a real issue uh, for any one of us and happens to a lot of us on a given day. I was just driving in rushing to get here to our offices to do this presentation today and trying to get in front of a car and I thought I'm having an E over P moment. This happens to everyone when they feel like they should be out in front of someone. It happens in selling environments a great deal. And I jokingly was at our convention last year and Melissa seemed to think I should still share this but um, we had a 70s party uh, the final night of our uh, convention last year, which was held in Las Vegas. And we all dressed up in 70s clothing, and kind of disco clothing. And I jokingly said at our meeting uh, that if you wanted to see what E over P really looked like, I could share with you an image of our regional vice president uh, in Europe who uh, was dressed in 70s clothes and immediately turned into a distinctly different person. This is Justin Wilson. Uh, one of our dear friends and longtime associates dressed in wonderful uh, 70s clothes and the, the group was laughing a fair amount and then I shared this small little video image of Justin dancing as some music was being played. We were shooting a promo video for the event. You can get a sense for this concept of E over P, right? This is a good example of it uh, and the finger point comes right there. So there's Justin demonstrating an E over P mentality. You might have noticed our CEO walking around in the back there as well in a 70s suit. Seems like everybody gets a little uh, excited uh, as that plays out. But we, we believe the best place to find an E over P environment is not to point fingers as I just did uh, to my friend Justin, but actually to look in the mirror. Um, the most effective way to use this formula is to ask yourself, what are my motivations? Why do I do what I do? And find out if you're honestly living a life that you say, yeah, I make my decisions, I use my time and resources, the way I interact with others, I try to place my motivations and commitments to principles higher than just uh, my motivation to ego and economics. A quick anecdote about this, I, uh, I gave this presentation, gosh, almost five years ago, and a gentleman came up from the back of the room who had had a long history in the industry and he came to me and he said, I have to apologize to you. Um, I've been sent here by the CEO of a competitor of yours who was concerned about your company as we were starting to grow. And he asked me to sit in the back of the room and take notes and figure out what it is you guys are doing because we're starting to lose some of our distributors to your company. And then he said to me, I have to tell you that I am the formula that you just talked about, I am an E over P person. And he actually got a little emotional and all he said to me was, I'm sorry, I owe you an apology and he left and I never saw him again. So the best thing to have this kind of formula do is just audit yourself. In, his, in this guy's case, he felt like, you know what, I am more motivated by money and ego than I am to principles. And so be careful in judging others like I just did with our 70s friend, Justin Wilson and look at yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, what is it that I'm motivated by? Now let's go back. This is kind of a target score for us, a five and an eight, and then we add this notion of capacity. Um, capacity to me means your actual or potential ability. If I have a, if I have a, a bottle of water here, it's 16.9 fluid ounces or 500 milliliters of water. If I pour some of this water out, and then kind of reassess it. Has the capacity changed at all? And the truth is no. And so regardless of how much water it might have in it, the capacity remains at 500 milliliters. I believe that human beings all have a high capacity. And whether their actual ability is the water inside of it may seem low, I think their potential is significant. And we owe it to ourselves to try to promote and encourage people to reach for their full potential. In this case, I used to love looking for and trying to promote inside of our organization a target score that looked uh, a lot like a 588. Now this is a dangerous profile score here that I have on the screen, super, super dangerous. Um, when I share this uh, all around the world, I was in Romania speaking to several hundred people 
in uh, the, the second largest building in the world, the parliament building in, in Romania. And I asked the people, uh, do you see this kind of a formula in your lives? Do you see an 828? And unfortunately, a lot of them referred to politicians or others in their community that are really capable. So the far right score is an eight, but their commitment to truths and principles have been compromised in the name of ego and economic motivations. And so an 828 can be a very dangerous profile and one that you certainly you don't want to promote yourself, but you probably ought to keep your eyes open and see if, uh, if that's the profile of those that you're associating with or working with. And so the target score for us becomes this notion of 588, keep your E under P and always drive up your C. Drive up your capacity, push on yourself, try to develop and, and become. Uh, quick reference to this notion of a target score. Um, you know, uh, this can always move. I tell people your EP score can move like your blood pressure. You can have a moment when you're trying to make uh, qualify for a trip, maybe this Cancun trip that we just had. And you might see yourself so interested in driving the outcomes for the trip that you may start to shift your score a little bit. Maybe your ego and economic commitments to make the trip become more important than the principles and the people around you. And so I always tell people, Manage your motives carefully. This is a, a, a motive management model. And ask yourself from time to time, you know, am I motivated by principles more than ego and economics? Okay, let's pivot to this second concept, which is this concept of way of being born of this book of mine that's one of my favorites called The Anatomy of Peace. And the concept of The Anatomy of Peace is, can be summarized pretty simply. I, I've taught uh, all over the world and had occasion to visit with and teach a lot of different people. And early on in the company, I was very anxious to find content that would rec reflect this, this cultural identity that we were trying to create. And I've long been a fan of this book. Uh, um, it, it's a major, major concept in philosophy that I believe helps any relationship, any company, any culture to get better, more effective, more efficient, and more harmonious. I highly recommend it to you. You ought to be able to download it. And given that I'm not speaking to a block of Romanians today, I'm confident you can get it in English and, and you'll enjoy it. Um, but here's the, the summary thesis of this. Um, people respond mostly to the way that we feel about them, not what we say or do. I'm hoping you can actually see that uh, on your screens or you can collapse the video there. So this is an interesting concept. How we feel about people actually prevails more than necessarily what we say or do. And this may seem like a very simple concept, but I don't know that we truly embrace this as much as we should. This suggests that beneath our behaviors of saying or doing something, there's this concept of a way of being. And our way of being actually resonates and communicates with other people. And let me, let me walk you through a little more detail about how this works. Anything I say or do that might be embodied in the concept of a behavior, there's this line and beneath the line, there's this concept of how I'm seeing other people. And beneath that line is where the way of being lives. It's below the surface of what I say or do and can be embodied in two concepts. One is a heart at peace and the other is a heart at war person that has a heart at peace sees other people as people. Uh, they understand that they appear real to them just as I am real to myself. And they understand the cares, concerns, the hopes, the aspirations, the fears of other people to be the same as me and my own. The implications of this are that I'm responding to the humanity of another person when I see them as a person. Whereas a heart at war comes at it from a different angle. I start to see people as objects. They're not real to me um, because I appear, they appear less real to me as I do to myself. And I kind of justify my position saying that their cares and concerns matter actually less to me uh, than my own cares do. And in this particular column, you're resisting the humanity of other people. And this may seem a little slippery, but I've learned that this is a very, very true thing. And I've seen organizations and corporations lose their spirit or soul, as I said earlier, by allowing the organizations as a whole to move from a heart at peace 
into an environment where they start to promote and allow hearts at war. Now, this may be something simple. I'll give you a simple example. Um, I travel, have traveled a, a great deal in my career. And I was at the airport one morning and watching a mother with three little kids trying to get through the security line. It was an early Monday morning, as I recall, and there were lots of business people trying to get to their gates and get to their flights and get on their way. And I found it fascinating that I could see that her humanity was not real to them, that they didn't see her at that time or her kids as people with concerns or fears or worries, but rather for them, if you go to this other side, this hard at war side, maybe this particular woman was an object that was less real to them because they were needing to get to their meetings or their flights or their gate. And I watched as this woman struggled to get her children through security, and I was pretty close to her, and I walked up to her. Now, the reason I felt this way is I have six kids. I've traveled, frankly, a fair amount with them, and everyone looks at us at an airport like on the sound of music. Um, and these little kids follow me around. And I had a compassion and a feeling of concern for this woman. I saw her as a person. And I've certainly failed this test often, but in this particular instance, I walked up to her and said, listen, you worry about getting your kids through and I'll get these bags up on the belt and we'll get them through the scanning system. And I said, I don't, I don't, I'm, I don't certainly want you to get nervous about me being a stranger helping you with your kids, but I can certainly help you with these bags. And in that moment, I could just sense and feel I felt better about myself because I was seeing her as a person and she could sense and feel that I was seeing her as a person and she thanked me and got her through security and, and she went on her way. And what I've found is uh, this has happened on planes, this happens in all these different environments where somebody might become an object to you instead of a person and your degree of influence will go up or down based on how clearly and how well you see people as people. I'll give you one other example that might be helpful. Uh, we're in the business of trying to create influence, influence on other people in such a way that they believe and want to engage in what we're doing. And as you go out and speak with people, you can see them as people or you can see them maybe as objects inside of your organization, whether it's in your uh, enrollment or uh, trees or in your binary organizations. You can see them as representing someone for you that could create income or generate outcomes that you need. And I think that's typically a real subtle invitation to start seeing those people as objects. But I submit to you that your success will swing on the hinge of how quickly you can kind of self audit where your heart is vis-a-vis -vis these other people and really approach these people viewing them as people, not as objects. See them as real, see their hopes and their fears and concerns just like you see your own. And what I've seen is that as people truly respond to how you feel about them, this below the surface way of being, as opposed to what you're saying or how you're promoting the product or the opportunity to them, you have a much higher degree of influence on them. Now, one other piece that I'm going to add to this that I didn't necessarily say last year at convention, but if you marry this heart at peace with what I refer to as a refined indifference, that is, let people make decisions. Don't try to be overly persuasive with them. Uh, we're barraged every day with uh, all sorts of marketing messages that are trying to persuade and convince. And what I've learned is, if I will approach a person with an honest heart, and in this case, a heart at peace, where I'm seeing them as a person, they're real to me, I want to be helpful to them, then marry my offer to get involved or to try the product with what I'm referring to as a refined indifference. That is, don't try to overly persuade them. Just present what you believe to be true and helpful and then honor their agency. Recognize that they have the ability to choose and don't spend so much time, as I've often said, trying to change their eye color. It's not gonna change. It's not uncommon for someone to come to me at a meeting and say, Tyler, what should I do? My sister won't try the product no matter what I say or do, and I'm often heard to say, leave her alone. Um, I don't believe the industry should, we should run around trying to over persuade or over convince. And it's my experience that people will respond to how we feel about them. And if we treat them as people and honor their ability to make a choice and campaign from a position of belief and confidence and conviction with them, we're gonna end up in a much, much better place with them and allow them to choose, honor their agency and step back. You'll be surprised how many people will generate their own interest almost reflexively 
Whereas if you do it the other way, their reflexes are typically, hey, I'm not, I'm not very interested in this. So this may be some subtle philosophical things, but if you read this book, I believe it'll help your marriages or your relationships with your significant others, your children or other family members, neighbors, colleagues, and associates. It's a simple way to ask yourself, am I approaching those that I'm around every day with a sense or a heart at peace or a heart at war? And we believe very strongly that your degree of success and influence will climb dramatically as you start to audit yourself and, and put yourself back in the box of a heart of peace. So hopefully that uh, is helpful to you. It's a, an enormously positive concept that's helped my life a great deal. And I would once again, highly recommend you, you read the book. So on the bottom uh, right of your screens, my screen uh, as well, is this simple notion of believe, belong, and become. And these aren't just bromides or platitudes that we throw on the wall here. There's an actual structural reason why we think that these three words that we call B3 or believe, belong, become are such a core part of our culture and ethos. And to illustrate that, I just want to tell you a little bit of a story about my family and then bring it back to these three key concepts for you. So um, I actually have, uh, as I mentioned before, I have six kids, a picture of my family in change and my oldest son, son Jacob, and then my next son, Joseph, uh, um, all the way on the far left is my son, Caleb. And then my daughter, who is just the gem of my life, my princess, is Ellie. And my two last boys, who were an attempt to get Ellie a sister, are Noah and James. My lovely wife, Allison, is uh, probably the best mom ever and super committed to our family. We always knew that we wanted to have a lot of kids, which is kind of an endangered species in the United States and uh, we just love our family. And I've learned more trying to raise children from children and from watching them than almost anything else. My children teach me things and I've learned the, the power of believe, belong, become in many ways uh, from them and I want to I want to share this with you. So I'm going to circle two of them. One on the far left there is Caleb and uh, the other is Noah. And, and Noah is now now nine at this timing of, of this picture. He was eight and Caleb was just barely 12. And um, I want to talk first about Noah, my little eight-year-old at the time. Uh, from the time he was born, he was a heart melter. He was just so cute. And I would come home from work and put him in a swing in the backyard. He could barely sit up in it big enough. He would sink down in it. And I would swing him all day and he would just smile at me and I'd take my camera out there and take pictures of him when he was, uh, when he was in the swing. And there was, a, uh, there was a movie in the United States about the time born called Nacho Libre. And it's kind of a comedy. I don't know if it's down in Australia. I imagine it would be with Jack Black. And it's, it's, a, it's a satire about Mexican wrestlers. And my little boy, his older brother's movie is kind of a joke. But um, my little Noah started to think that Nacho Libre was a bona fide superhero. And so at his second uh, birthday, um, he asked for a Nacho Libre cake, which my wife had to cook up and make, and he wanted a mask. And I couldn't get him to take the mask off to blow out the two candles at his second birthday. And early on, I tell you this for a reason, early on I noticed in my little Noah that he, uh, he had an imagination that he could be anything. And it started with this silly comedy, Nacho Libre, this Mexican wrestler. Um, but he also started to believe and do anything else that he saw his older brothers do. Or uh, if he watched a TV program, he had this sense that he could do anything. And uh, this continued. I mean, when my sons played American football as young boys, he, as a little boy that could barely even fit those smaller pads around his toes or the actual knee pads of my son's uniform, and he would ask to put on the uniform. And there he is in my kitchen, and he would put this on and walk around. And at night, when I took everything off to put him in his pajamas, I'd put up his zip-up pajamas, and he'd ask me to put the uniform back on. And he'd go to sleep at night thinking he was a, a football player, and I'd have to go in after he had – fallen fast asleep and take off the pads so he didn't hurt himself sleeping in them. If we were in the kitchen and starting to cook, 
he would in, run down in his pajamas and he would run to a drawer we have in the bottom of our kitchen drawer and pull out a chef's hat. I don't know where we got the chef's hat. Nobody runs around wearing it in our family, but he knew where it was and he would put it on and ask me to sit him up on the counter as I or my wife was cooking breakfast or dinner or lunch. And he always said, you know, I'm going to be a chef or I'm going to be a cook. Uh, when his older brothers got involved in Boy Scouting and Cub Scouts, he would take their uniforms. You can see his little arms don't quite fit this uniform. And we would dress him up completely in their uniforms. And he would go outside and he would do all the things that the scouts did and told me he was going to be an incredible scout. Uh, when, when he saw the movie The Karate Kid, he became convinced that he was going to be the next karate master. And you can see my point. At age eight, and frankly, in his case, from a little boy, He's always had this creative imagination that he could do anything and that he could be anything. Uh, we took a horseback riding trip with some friends of mine up into the And there's my whole clan, if you can believe it or not, all on horses. And I want you to, I'm going to zoom in for you on my little boy, Noah. And you can see his arm. He's and he to be on a horse. When he came home from this trip, he started looking in the newspaper and online for used horses and that his new calling was not a chef and it was not a football player and it was definitely not karate. He was going to be a cowboy. And I would come home from work. This is a true story. And he would tell me that there were horses for sale that I needed to go buy him a horse. And I knew I was smart enough to know that if I just, he saw something else later that week, he would pivot his attention on being a, a mountain biker or a, a road cyclist or something else. But he's just a special boy and he's always, always imagining what he can be. Now let me kind of go back to this picture and now talk about my 12 year old. And just to give you some sense quickly, you know, he's a phenomenal baseball player, loves to fish and hunt. This is he and I fishing, fly fishing together in the high mountains of Utah. He, he, uh, I took him on a bear hunting trip together. He loves to snow. Grandpa Virtus there, our other, our, my dad and founder of ASEA with his three grandsons uh, out snowmobiling up in the mountains of, of Wyoming. Uh, over on this side is him as a Boy Scout. He loves to play golf, and he plays the bass guitar in a band with his brothers. So this image shows a pretty well-adjusted kid that's well-rounded, has lots of different interests, and pretty solid. And um, you can imagine my surprise when I got a phone call from one of his teachers at school. And uh, she said, I'm just calling because I'm a little concerned about Caleb. And I was surprised and asked her what was going on. And she proceeded to tell me that he was struggling in school and wasn't turning in his papers and uh, his homework and maybe acting out a little bit. And I promised her that I would visit with him and try to get to the bottom of what was going on. Shortly thereafter, he came to the house and came into my, I asked him to come into my office and I asked if everything was okay and um, asked if, uh, if there was something that was bothering him. And he was pretty quick to say, no, dad, everything's fine. And then his face kind of changed colors and got scared and a little bit of meek when I told him his teacher had called from school and had told me that, um, that things weren't kind of as smooth in her class as they needed to be and that she was concerned about you. And at that point, he got really meek, and his face kind of softened up, and he, he was looking down. And I could tell he was just about ready to start to cry. And I said, Caleb, what's wrong? Talk to me. What's going on? And I'll never forget what he said to me that day, and I'm happy to tell you that it's not been a long-term issue, but it taught me a great lesson about the principles of believe, belong, become. He started to look at the performance and the homework and the test scores of other people around him. And he said to me, Dad, sometimes my drawings in my art class don't turn out as good as Tom's or Julie's. And I don't get as good at grades on my math tests as does Doug or William or Susan or these other people in his class. And his whole reason for no longer turning in his assignments his whole reason for acting out a little bit was he was starting to keep score as to where he stood relative to other people. And as a dad, I'm working really hard to create a clear sense of identity in him, that he's great at a lot of different things and he's a super kid. 
But I was amazed to compare and contrast how between the ages of eight, my son Noah, who believes that he can do anything, and now the age of 12, something happens in the world where we start to pay more attention to other people. And I see this happen in network marketing. I see this happen at a C. I see this happen in a lot of different settings. We do this as adults. We look around the room and we say, well, I'm not as good a speaker as this person, or uh, you know, my body doesn't look like this person's body, or I'm not a triple diamond and I don't think I could ever do that. And I can't, you know, I can't uh, enroll people the way this person does. And I've become utterly convinced that the, the greatest resource at risk in the world has not to do with oil or all the resources that we fight over in the world. It's actually the human resource. It's the greatest thing at risk. People end up believing that they can no longer do certain things. And here's this 12-year-old boy of mine that started to actually believe that he couldn't do it. And the reason I compare and contrast an 8-year-old with a 12-year-old is my 8-year-old hasn't spent a whole lot of time doing the math in his head as to whether or not he couldn't be a cowboy or a chef or a football player. Um, they have this pure heart. When you're 8 years old, everybody gets invited to the birthday parties. Everyone's included. But as you get a little older, the world starts to teach you that some people are good or some people are in and some people are not. And I just think that's absolute rubbish and trash. And I don't agree with it at all. And I've wanted from day one to create a conditional, an environment or a condition where people could come to ASEA and leave all that trash and baggage behind them. Whether that came from a loved one, a parent, a grandparent, a sibling, or people around you at school, it's just absolutely not true. And that's what underscores this first concept in this three-word ethos for us. It's believing, believing in yourself, believing in the product that we're representing, the Renew28 product, and then hopefully very soon the Redox supplement that we have, the core product for the company, believing in the compensation potential and believing in other people. And it's been my experience when two people believe in each other. If I'm working with you and I really truly believe that you can succeed, then in some way, if you believe in me, we fundamentally belong to each other. And as that grows from two people to four people to 10 people to so on and so forth, the greater the organization grows and the greater we're committed to believing in ourselves and believing in our company and our product and our opportunity, and then ultimately believing in the others that are around us, a belonging starts to emerge. And you know from Maslow's hierarchy of needs and any research around the notion of belonging, but just above really food and shelter and protection, the greatest human need that people have is to belong to something, to actually feel like they belong. In the financial industry, if I say I'm long a certain stock, that means I own it. I own the stock. So if I say I'm long Coca-Cola stock, that means I own it. And I believe this concept of owning each other and belonging to each other is what the word belong really represents. And so believing precedes belonging and then belonging informs and prefigures development or becoming. And I've said since almost the very beginning of this company, this industry overstates the income. And I have a phrase that's a play on words that counters that by saying that the outcome is not just income. The outcome is become and overcome and then income. I mentioned uh, earlier as we started the call that you know the, the greatest reward is not necessarily what we earn from our labors, but what we become by our labors. And this industry is like a fast forward on human development. I've watched it happen. I've watched people come into this business just a few years ago as we started, who stayed the course with us, really engaged in our development programs and trained, pushed themselves outside of their comfort zone, and who they are today, how they talk and interact with people, the degree of influence they have, is utterly and completely 100% different than who they were when they started. And to me, that is an enormous outcome and one of our highest priorities here at ASEA is we want people to come as they are, leave the baggage behind of whatever self uh, kind of discounting thoughts they've had or been taught and believe in themselves, believe in us enough to try uh, believe in the product, believe in the opportunity, and then engage. And in that process, there's a, be a belonging that occurs. People start to support you and influence you. 
that belonging almost always prefigures your own personal development. The word develop comes from the same word as envelop, which means to surround. And so your development, it has a lot to do with what's around you, what's enveloping you or surrounding you. And that concept of development is an important piece for us here to see and it's embodied in that third word of becoming. So we're sharing that with you in Australia. We've shared it all over Europe. We've shared it in the United States. And we challenge you to give some thought to that, process it. It's not uh, just a fluffy bunch of words we throw on the wall. It means a lot to us. And it's something we hope uh, you'll sense as you get closer to us and get to know kind of the heart and ethos of what we stand for, that this is real stuff for us. Okay, let's talk about the last one and then I'll, I'll summarize and let you guys. Um, you know, um, as we've built the company, I've come across different philosophies or cultural pieces that I've really felt resonate and reflect what we're trying to do here to see it. My mom sent me a story. I've researched and tried to identify if the story is 100% true or if it was created. And I've, I've only found one reference point for it. But the story goes like this. It's instructive either way. That an anthropologist was studying the culture of a South African nation. And he gathered a group of children together and set a basket of fruit, uh, maybe 50 to 100 yards away from the children and kind of drew a line in the dirt and said to the children, OK, everybody line up on this and I'm going to blow a whistle. And when I blow the whistle and it sounds out, that's the, the moment when you should run from this line in the sand all the way towards this uh, basket of fruit. And those of you that get there first are invited to take as much of the fruit as you can hold in your arms, and it's yours. And uh, you know, some of you may get none, and some of you may get there first. So he lined up all these kids together and, and put the fruit down a, a ways. And um, what happened was um, these children, instead of running, which I, you would think is a natural thing for them, when the whistle sounded, they reached out with their hands and they grabbed each other's hands. And they slowly walked from the line towards this basket of fruit, all holding hands. And then sat in a circle. I, we found this picture. I love this picture. They sat in a circle. Maybe it looked something like this. And pulled the fruit out and handed a, took a apple or the fruit to the next person. The anthropologist was absolutely amazed. He couldn't believe what he was seeing. And in the story that my mother sent to me, he asks a couple of the children, how, how is it possible? Did you not understand that you could have gotten to the fruit first and gotten more? And they said that they looked at him and said, how can we all be happy if one of us is sad? And then he uttered this phrase called Ubuntu. And uh, when I saw this story, uh, gosh, it's been two or three years ago, I, I really said to myself, this is a beautiful, beautiful philosophy, and I'm going to research it. And I started to research the philosophy of Ubuntu. And Ubuntu, translated as literally as possible into English, simply means that I am because we are. And you can find the derivative of this philosophy. It's kind of a, a pseudo-religious philosophy and philosophy of men that you find all throughout Africa. It's got a little variation on the word, but it embodies how they treat each other. And Desmond Tutu was once said, Ubuntu means if you travel into a town, you need not worry about food or lodging or entertainment in these old villages. They immediately acknowledge that Ubuntu carries the day. That's the prevailing core value or ethos of the culture. And let me make sure you're clear on what we mean when we say ethos, just kind of as an aside. Every culture has a set of beliefs, characteristics, and, and kind of norms or attitudes that, that embody this whole cultural concept. But most cultures also have a central fundamental value that is the distinguishing spirit or fundamental principle of their culture. In the Hawaiian Islands, the Polynesian culture, it's embodied in one word. It's called aloha. And if you ask people, what is aloha? Most often they'll say that it means hello, because when you arrive in Hawaii, if you've been there, they, you know, you bow down kind of, and they put a lay of flowers around you. And, and then of course you embrace and say aloha. But aloha actually means love. 
And so the ethos of the Hawaiian culture is aloha or love. And that one word becomes the distinguishing spirit of how they treat and interact with each other. I had a gentleman that worked for me many years ago on the island of Oahu there on the windward side of the island. And every time I came out, he would invite me to do something that was uniquely Hawaiian. And one time he took me out, he was a professional boogie boarder and I got absolutely pummeled by the waves and uh, uh, had a great day trying to do what he did, but he did it very well. And as we were walking back to his truck, he had some fins, some Churchill fins and his board with him. And a fellow Hawaiian was getting out of his truck, parked very close to where we were going. And he was rummaging around the back of his truck bed, looking for his fins. He had his boogie board in hand, but he didn't, he, he couldn't find his fins. And my friend Rich saw this and basically walked over to him and handed him his fins. Now these are 300 US dollar fins. And um, he simply said, aloha. And he gave him a shaka symbol and just said aloha to him and we walked off. And I asked him, did you know this person? Do you know who he was? And he said, no, but this is aloha. This is how we live here. Um, this, this will come back to me and this is what we do. And I was so taken by the fact that they believe that core principle so much in that culture that at least in his case, they're willing to live it. Well, this Ubuntu principle is an ethos. It's a distinguishing spirit. And if you stop and think about it, there's plenty in the world that teaches us I am because I am. Um, but there's not much left that's actually teaching us that I am because, in fact, we are. That simple concept says that no person really arrives at any station in life, any degree of success or accomplishment in the absence of other people. And that any decision that we make should be made in the context of how it might affect others. As simple as gathering more fruit than maybe I can even eat at one time and leaving someone without. And in network marketing, and especially here at ASEA, this philosophy of Ubuntu should prevail. What it says is any person walking across the stage and being acknowledged for a rank advancement or for anything that they've done successfully never, ever could have happened in the absence of a whole group of people that represent the we. And if we could promote a culture where we stopped before over-promoting ourselves and looked around us and acknowledged that I'm actually here because we're all here. No person is here individually uh, at all. The truth of the matter is my father and I and others that helped start the company get a lot of credit in the field. People are very kind to us. It's actually not the healthiest thing. We didn't do anything more than invite others to come join us. And the real heroes to me in this organization are anyone that started, particularly those leaders that started in early stages of the company or in early stages of country openings, uh, like many of you in Australia. We are because you are. I am because we are. And so we really try to promote this notion of Ubuntu throughout the company. And I shared this at a, con a convention, gosh, two or three years ago. And it's been really fun to see this become part of the way we think and talk and try to treat each other. Now, unless some of you might be saying, well, these are all really nice, fluffy principles. Uh, this isn't really the real world. And I want to tell you that I'm a hopeless idealist. I won't apologize for bringing forward solid principles and ideals that could underscore this notion of our beliefs, behaviors, and characteristics. Does this mean that every person that's inside of ASEA is striving to live by these beliefs and characteristics? No. But it does mean that at the corporate level, and frankly, all the way at the top, I sit on the board of directors as the chairman of that board and work directly every day with Chuck Funky and our senior leadership team. And we believe these things. And we ask ourselves often, are we making a decision that has E over P implications? Are we trying to treat other people as objects or are we treating them as real people? Do we believe and promote the notion of belonging and becoming inside the company? And then do we step back and recognize that I am because we are as a whole? And it's these cultural principles that uh, at least in our years have kind of represented the four corners or the four pillars, if you will, of this ethos and culture that we've been trying to build. And I feel so grateful, I'm actually really humbled to think that all the way around the globe, you folks on a Sunday morning would take some time and allow me to just share a little bit about what I think helps us to be a little different. Uh, we're normal people. Uh, if you came to my house, you'd see a pile of laundry and a lot of kids running around. 
And uh, we don't want to act as though we're bigger than we are or better than we are. We have a product that deserves to be into the world, both our Renew product and then as you get familiar with our Redox supplement, I think you're going to be amazed at the blessing that can be in people's lives. Uh, my dad lives in the same home he lived in when he started this. Uh, I don't know if, about you, but a 69-year-old man from Salt Lake City developing a product from salt water didn't seem like a very likely thing to spread to 25 countries in four and a half years, um, but it is. And there's hundreds of thousands of people in all these different cultures that are coming to it. And what we've learned is that this type of business kind of shrinks the world and kind of swells your heart. Uh, I've learned that these values and principles that I've shared with you today resonate in Italy the way they resonate in the UK, they resonate in down under, they resonate in Canada and down into Mexico. People are good. And while there's always something you can find that's not good, uh, I believe that if you send out light, it'll attract light. And that's what we're trying to do here. Do I think we're the only company in the world where someone can succeed? No. Do I think we're the best of all the best? I actually don't run around saying that. I think there's lots of good places where you could give your time and energy. Um, I do feel that we're sincere about what we're trying to do with these cultural principles and trying to create relationships that are enduring and that help you to actually reach your full potential in every dimension of your life, not just in a rank and compensation structure. And so I express my real sincere gratitude to Bart and Melissa for inviting me to participate uh, on this call with you guys today. And uh, thank you for taking some time, precious time actually on a Sunday morning to just let us share a little bit about what it is that we believe and, and what we do here at ASEA. And I so look forward to the opportunity to get to know you and meet you each individually as you come to our convention and then ultimately as we come down to celebrate with you and, and, and further launch uh, the Australian market. So thanks so much for giving me a chance to do this with you, Bart and Melissa. And uh, I'll wrap there and turn the time uh, back to you. Well, Tyler, thank you so much for taking your time. Uh, we feel um, honored to be associated with this, uh, with this company. And, and we love the fact that you're a hopeless idealist. <laughs> we absolutely do. The thing that, that I believe that really sets a, a sea apart from at least, uh, at least our experience and the experience of a lot of people that we, we know is exactly what you've been talking about today, and that's the, the cultural. The cu cultural difference, the ethos of the company um, really is about becoming more, and you know, this is a, a, a perfect example of that. I um, just love the, uh, the strategies that the company has in terms of you know, filled focus and, and expansion and growth and the fact that uh, you're willing to take your valuable time and, and share some of these important concepts with us. So we're, uh, we're committed to moving forward and doing everything we can to, to promote this kind of a concept as well as the phenomenal technologies that we've got. And um, thank you very much. Thanks, Bart. Thanks, Tyler. Thank you, Melissa. Hope you're doing well. Have a great Sunday, guys. I'll sign off. Thanks so much. Yes, bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.